Hi everyone and welcome to London Tech Leaders Series 3. For those who haven't joined us previously, uh, essentially London Tech Leaders is a, is a growing platform for heads of transformation, transformation leaders, CXO kind of level, board level discussions. Um, and it's an opportunity to discuss the latest industry trends in the market, challenge conventional thinking. Um, but when we go back to kind of in-person events, it's a real opportunity to network with your peers, um, where you might not get to do so on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we've got a few questions as advertised. Um, at the moment, there has been, it's been reported that there's been a 41% increase in cyber crime um, during, uh, during the pandemic period. Um, I mean, cyber security is a, is a big issue. It seems to be evolving daily. Um, uh, to, today, I've, I've had to deal with some, some cyber crime in, in uh, my organization. It, I know that my colleagues will have elsewhere as well. It's, it's happening all the time. So, you know, what, what can we do about that? What, what, what level of investment do we need to make here? How important is it? You know, what sort of things can we do? Can we do to tackle the increase in, in uh, data breaches and, and general cyber security problems? The only truly secure system is one that is part of cast in a block of concrete and sealed in a lead lined room with armed guards. And even then, I have doubts. So uh, this is an extreme view, but it just sets the scene, I think, in, in my view. You know, I always look at cyber security as it's, it's like walking up a down escalator that just keeps getting faster. So, you know, whatever you did last, the last year isn't going to be enough to do this year. And, and I think the challenge is that as, uh, you know, as we start to move more of our business workflows and businesses, you know, and, and COVID's escalated this quite, quite quickly. You know, everybody's now working from home and I think, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Jacob talked into that, but also businesses are changing their, their, their business models. But, you know, we're seeing much more, um, a, a, a huge increase in internet um, financial traffic, going into people's homes, um, you know, the security that's required around, uh, you know, from, from a business perspective on those workflows that you, did, you, you weren't even using previously. You know, for me, it's always about this frictionless IT and how can we get security so that it's almost invisible to the end users. It's kind of there but they're not having to try and engage with it or it's not becoming an irritation to them. Yes, security is everybody's uh, responsibility. But I think we also have a responsibility, um, and I think Neve highlighted it, is, is to make it invisible to them. Um, because people are people. The, the, the bottom line is technology is a lot easier to change than culture. It's a lot easier to change a firewall rule than it is to stop a user community from sticking passwords on post-it notes. Um, Data-driven decision-making. We, we hear a lot, it's a bit of a buzzword, yeah? Data-driven decision-making, rolls off the tongue nicely. W what does it mean to you? How important is it? Is it a blip? Is it something that's gonna change our lives? And, and again, a bit like security, where are we in the maturity stakes as organizations with this? How far into it are we? In, in some instances, it's worse making, you know, it's a worse place to be making poor de you know, decisions on poor data because you think you've got crap, good data to make it on than, than not. And everybody's trying to make decisions based on different levels of trust in the data and you don't know where you are, right? And, and the complexity of that data is, is going up and up and up with every new uh, digital channel that's being opened with, you know, whether that's patient records, whether that's e-commerce orders, whether that's mobile payments with every new channel, that complexity and those routes get more complicated. But another, another angle on the use of data is, is also to do with the uh, improving the customer journeys. So an example of that, when you apply for uh, insurance, you know, uh, and this is getting better all the time, by the way, but you, you don't have to you know, fill in a multitude of forms just to provide that data. Now what you've got is the ability to enrich that data from uh, open data sources so that you can make the journey much more um, smoother, if you like, for, for, for the customers. And, and as a result of that, you get the data that you need from open sources that are reliable uh, and then short, shortcut that process. So you're doing validation as you're actually entering the data in a, in a uh, uh, quote and buy kind of uh, process. Neve, you've just joined an organisation during lockdown. I joined one five weeks into uh, five weeks before lockdown, so I know some of those challenges. 
how is it for you? And then, and then I think I'll probably ask somebody else about how is it, what are they doing for their new joiners and stuff? But, but what was your experience of joining an organization during lockdown, Nick? Yeah, good question. In fact, I, I not just joined it during lockdown, I did all my interviewing during lockdown and obviously left my, my old organization. When you're onboarding onto a new organization, the sort of things you need to think about are, um, it, it takes longer. Just, just quite physically almost takes longer because in fact, instead of walking around an office and being introduced to loads of people, you've got to set up loads of one-to-ones and do lots of calls and things like that. So it, it, is, it is very much harder uh, to do, should we say, a compressed induction. So if, you've got a, if, you, if you're onboarding people and you have a big agenda, I've got someone starting on Friday actually, and I've got a load of stuff for him to do. And it's gonna be a challenge because I'm gonna need him to get going, but then also I'm aware that the, that induction process is gonna take longer. So you have to be a bit more creative. I would say it is genuinely a bit harder. And so give yourself more time. We had a situation where one of my uh, direct reports hired uh, person A into their team and another hired person B into their team and one of those managers sent an introductory bottle of wine and the other one sent an introductory case of wine and that that in itself caused pandemonium because it was complete inequality across wine distribution so whatever your choice of onboarding your uh, staff during lockdown is that's my top tip is to is to get it right in terms of the ratios of wine bringing that through in terms of this is who we are this is what we do this is how we work you know put a put a team meeting in i mean i literally every week now have a, a you know a team meeting so that if anything you uptick the engagement you uptick the the, the face time with, with people just to try and maintain that engagement and and accept the fact that everybody is different some people want to turn on the video some people will have a background some people won't want any of that they'll just turn up on the on the speaker you just it is it's down to the individual it have been doing this for a while in terms of onboarding offshore organizations to work with and bringing that through in terms of this is who we are this is what we do this is how we work you know put a put a team meeting in i mean I literally every week now have a, a you know a team meeting so that if anything you uptick the engagement you uptick the the, the face time with, with people just to try and maintain that engagement and and accept the fact that everybody is different some people want to turn on the video some people will have a background some people won't want any of that they'll just turn up on the on the speaker it just it is it's down to the individual. So recent shifts in customer engagement. Um, is, is this something that we should be looking to do? You know, COVID's changed the way that customers engage, you know, in, in, in your industry in particular, there's quite a, quite a lot of change there. Um, should we look at changing our existing business models? Do we need to, re- or, or is it all just, it's a glitch, it'll be over soon, just stick with a plan, you know, don't, don't, no need to adapt. What, what, what should we do there? contactless ordering was already coming through in a lot of market high street places the deliveries uber eats click and collect was, were already in place now the the acceleration of those across any brand is is you know more far more significant i think if you're in an industry where you know step one is is register the consumer step two is send them lots of paper to sign that process fundamentally has to shift pretty quickly or the regulations have to shift to allow the industry to survive in a, in a, in a remote working future way of, of, of consumer engagement. So your point is almost, it doesn't matter whether COVID's a blip or not. Our, our BAU is that we've got to adapt and change because if it's not COVID, it'll be something else. And we just got to keep reiterating and iterating around, right? We were already starting um, a digital transformation to try and move effectively a, a, a paper-based old mar- you know, old style market to a digital market. Um, and what we've seen is actually this has been an accelerator for us. But it showed, I think, everyone that you can affect great change and do it very rapidly. And it's bumpy and it's never perfect. And there are people for whom it doesn't work, but it shows you that there is so much that's possible to do very rapidly. And perhaps we're guilty sometimes of holding ourselves back um, and saying, oh, well, maybe that's not going to work. Maybe users won't like it. Maybe people won't like it. And actually, sometimes you've just got to press the go button. 
Um, Lalita asks a, a, an interesting question in, in this regard to employees and, and people working. COVID has brought about new unanticipated ways of working within the remote space, which I believe we might now consider as part of our long term work policy package. So what do we think about that? If we're changing the way people are working, you know, and, and it's been forced, as Des was saying, and, and we're now doing that, how should we be looking at people's packages, their compensation, how we support them in those remote working ways? How, how does that how does that factor in? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I think it's a case of care for what you wish for, because I think, you know, it, it, if, if, if actually from an, from an organizational point of view, you know, on a personal level, I, you know, I would definitely question the fact that I, you know, my, somebody's compensation of, takes into account things like traveling to London. We used to have London waiting, for instance, in London. Like that went away and it got baked into people's, um, in, in people's salaries. But that was a payment because of the cost of coming to London, the cost of London lunches were all higher. Well, if that goes away, why, why, why would I be looking to pay somebody more for working in London when I can pay them the same to, to go out? And just in the last month, we've we've recruited two completely remote um, employees in the technical discipline, um, and and you know everybody's going, oh, didn't didn't know we could do that, you know. And so I think that's you know really opening up that pool. People on this call as technology leaders have had a call about the corporate technology being poor. It's really slow today, and it's well that's because you've got teenagers at home streaming Xbox games or whatever. It, it, you know where does it stop now? Our boundaries will fundamentally shift from a technology point of view over the coming months and years, I think, as these new ways of working are, are adopted and, and, and we change, we change how we go about our business. I did see a, a, a scenario where people will stop traveling to get to the office, to sit at a desk and, and do their work from a desk. I think it becomes much more about the whiteboarding question you know i'll go to the office because i need to meet with some people and we'll have a, a whiteboarding exercise so i think in the, the redesign of the office if you like of the new normal it's going to be more around less desks more meeting spaces um, um, more meeting rooms what would you say the impact has been on productivity there, there is a mental health um challenge i think around how we keep people motivated and engaged and i think it's quite easy to fall into the trap of assuming that everyone's at home with a very traditional setup you know at home with a with a spouse or partner and kids or you know who, who don't require too much attention and 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 you've got space and, and and convenience of an office and somewhere to work that's really not the case for, for many people so i think we haven't seen it hit yet but we're seeing it in the survey results people starting to say i'm not sure if i want to continue exactly like this so this flexible mode i think will be key going forward this part work part going Going in part of staying at home making sure the team feel that flexibility that if they can't start at nine o'clock because they have child care or, or you know um somebody else needs to use their network then fine have the meeting at 10 o'clock you know if people need to finish their working day at four or five then so be it it's not it is it is i think about creating a a, a collaborative culture where you're not afraid to have a dog barking because you're actually at home and you are working and it's just somebody's come to the door at a really inconvenient time it, it's great to hear this kind of thing from us as leaders because that's where that's where the bar needs to be set not just in giving people license to the showing a bit of leadership in our behavior as well how do we stop as this goes on further how do we stop the erosion of culture and and, and for, particularly for new people coming in but i think everybody's gonna have to find their own new, new norm i think that's going to be the thing so I can't believe you ended this by saying getting new normal in there. That, that was an awful plan. <laughs> um, uh, we avoided it the whole blooming meeting and then you got it right in at the end. I'm dropping some more, uh, some more in there. Thanks to all our speakers um, this evening. Um, really great event, very insightful. Hopefully um, everyone in the, the audience loved it as well.